All right, so, so the big topic today is sampling and uh, more, more specifically, uh, analog to digital conversion. And I'm back. So, so here's the basic idea. The basic idea is you have, you have some, some wave, you know, I'll, I'll usually use sine waves as an example, but um, there's some wave and you want to sample this and turn this into a digital number. And so you need to do two things. You need to pick um, your Y levels. You need to decide how many bits you're going to allocate to the sample. And eight bits is common, 16 bits is common. Uh, so so that, that will divide, if you choose eight bits, you'll get 256 different levels. So here I've only drawn a few of those levels. And the other thing you need to do is decide exactly when you're going to sample. And so um, when, when you sample, you want to sample regularly. And when you sample, it's often not going to be when the sine wave is exactly at one of these levels. And so if, if that's your input sine wave, what you'll actually get out, the samples will round to the nearest level. So say you, so you sample right here, it's probably going to round down. And then you sample over here, it, it might round it up. And you sample here, and it's going to round it up. And then you sample here, and it's going to keep rounding it up. And you sample here, it's going to be somewhere over here. And then you connect all of these. So, so, so what you get is just a sequence of numbers, which we'll, we'll often draw as dots or little dots with sticks. But then when you turn this back into so, so you have your, your set of numbers and you turn it back into an analog signal. Um, so you saw last time, you just tell the digital to analog converter, go to this voltage, go to that voltage, go to that voltage. And if you do that every sample period, you'll end up with what looks like a step, uh, a step wave. So it'll sort of go, go like this and it'll go down maybe here. And it'll keep going. So, as you can tell from this, this picture, there are really two, two issues when you're sampling. One is the, the, uh, the rounding, rounding um, number of bits. And this is what, when they first encounter this, this is what people usually think is the biggest limitation. Uh, but this usually doesn't turn out to be a, that big of a limitation. Often there's a lot of noise in the system. So this, the sine wave comes with a little bit of noise. And as long as you sample finely enough that the noise is bigger than the distance between the levels, you're adding extra bits doesn't, doesn't help at all because the noise is already there pushing you around more than one level. So you can buy a fancy 16-bit analog digital converter, but it might be that there's enough noise in your system that an 8-bit one would have been just as good. Uh, you're not getting any additional information. That's not just pure noise. So often these analog digital converters are, are specified as you know, how many bits of real resolution there are, even if it gives you a number that appears to have higher resolution. So you know, we'll, we'll work with 8-bit resolution. Uh, I think the analog to digital converters on your boards can go up to 12-bit resolution, which is pretty good. Uh, your oscilloscopes have analog digital converters that I think can go up to 14 bits. Uh, CD audio quality is 16-bit. And it's rare that you'll encounter anything that's more accurate than that. Certainly nothing that goes fast that's more accurate than that. Uh, your uh, multimeter, for example, has an effective resolution much higher, but that, that's because it takes many, many, many samples and averages them together. So all this noise kind of averages away and you get a more accurate number. But that's why the multimeter is so slow. It doesn't update its screen very often. And I'm, and I'm not gonna say much more about this sort of vertical scale and the levels. Um, so, you know, as long as the levels are closer together than, than the noise level in your, in your input signal, um, you're, you're fine. And, and usually this is not the limiting factor. But what's much more interesting, what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about is the horizontal scale. So sampling, sampling, um, maybe time, time, time resolution. So, 
So you may naively think that this boxy signal isn't good enough and we should sample way, way more than, than we are for this boxy signal. Um, you know, you, you might come up with some naive sampling theorem that says, well, if I want a nice representation of this, this smooth wave, maybe I need to sample 10 times or 100 times per, per cycle. But there's, there's a pretty amazing theorem by Nyquist and Shannon, who were engineers in Bell Labs back in the 40s and 50s. And they said that in order to reconstruct an input signal perfectly, no error, you only need to sample a little bit faster than twice its frequency. And here I'm sampling it way faster than twice its frequency, and it still doesn't look like I'm constructing it perfectly. That's because we haven't done the, the next step, which is to, to low pass filter this blue wave and smooth it out a little bit. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So where, where does this two factor of two come from? Well, naively, I, I think of the factor of two as, well, if, if you want to sample, you need to at least capture the, the top and the bottom and the top and the bottom. If you're, if you're not capturing it, at least the top and the bottom, then you're you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to be able to reconstruct a sine wave that's this fast. And, and when you capture the top, bottom, top, bottom, that's sampling at twice the frequency of the wave. Because remember, the frequency of the wave, or the period of the wave goes from peak to peak. You're sampling at least twice as often as that. It's kind of a, uh, a quick way to remember that, where that factor of two comes from. But what happens if, what happens if you don't sample fast enough? What happens if you sample way too slow? You know, for example, what happens if you sample um, sample one one up here, but then the next sample you make is here, and the next sample you make is way over here? Then what you're going to do is you're going to reconstruct a wave. The best you can do is kind of interpolate between these, and you'll get something with an extremely long period, extremely slow uh, slow variation, extremely low frequency. So what we did was we started with this, this green sine wave that was, it was pretty fast, and we sampled too slow, and we got a sine wave that was lower frequency. And that's bad. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be the problems with sampling. It's gonna be called aliasing. And let's, let's examine how that works in a little bit more detail. And uh, for the first time in this class, I'm really gonna start drawing frequency spectra. So, so let, me draw, let me draw a spectra of, of audio audio signal. So you can think of this as some random song with a bunch of bass and treble and people singing. And, uh, and it, it has a frequency spectra that goes from low frequencies up to sort of less than the human ear can hear. So the, the highest that a human ear can hear is around 20 kilohertz. So the spectrum of a real song might, and, and the lowest the human can hear is about 20 hertz and different Different people are different, but uh, you know the spectrum of a song might look like this, or it might look like that if it has more midtones. I'm going to sort of always draw the spectra as having a lot of bass and kind of falling off in some triangly way down, stopping right before 20 kilohertz. So there's some spectrum that looks like this, and you know depending on what song you listen to or what you're playing, if, if there's a lot of bass, um, if it'll be tilted toward bass. If there's a lot of treble, it'll be tilted toward treble. But I'm going to draw this audio spectra like this. Um, one of the things that makes the analysis of, okay, so, so what is the goal here? The goal is um, I have some input waveform, and it could be audio, like it could be composed of a whole bunch of different frequencies. And I sample, and I turn that back into a digital signal, and I get this blue stair step signal. And I want to know what does the frequency spectrum of that square step, square, square stair step signal look like? So the original signal is going to look like this. It's going to start at zero, you know, or near zero, and it's going to go up to 20 kilohertz. Um, and the goal is to figure out what does the spectrum of this blue wave look like for different sampling periods. So here, here for this blue one, my, my sampling period was, was there. So T, T sample. This is going to be one over F sample. All right, so I want, I want to get the frequency spectrum of those blue signals. Now, the, there's an intermediate step to getting this, this frequency spectrum, and, and that involves complex numbers and complex frequency. 
And so maybe some of you have seen this, but I, I think it's, it's best to just review it quickly. Um, just remember Euler's formula, e to the i phi is cosine phi plus i sine phi, and e to the minus i phi is cosine phi minus i sine phi. And if you want to know what cosine and sine themselves are, you could take these two and either add them together and that cancels the signs and you just get two cosines. Or if you subtract them together, you cancel the cosines and get two signs. But either way, you can write cosine as a half e to the plus i phi plus a half e to the minus i phi and sine phi is one over two i e to the plus i phi minus one over two i e to the minus i phi. All right, so now I'm gonna talk mostly like we just have a single, single frequency, even though in reality audio has a whole slew of frequencies. But imagine we just had a single cosine wave, say. If we were to represent it as a, um, a real frequency, you would just take your frequency of the real cosine wave, say it's 10, 10 kilohertz or something, and the spectrum of that cosine wave would just be a spike right at 10 kilohertz. If we were to represent this in complex frequency, we have to ask what, so, so there'd be cosine of uh, 10 kilohertz times time, times two pi, and so that's what we go into this pi. If we were to represent it as a complex number, half of that would become positive frequency. So half of that would still be at plus, plus 10 kilohertz. And half of that would be at minus 10 kilohertz. And in general, if we had a, some spectrum that looked like this, if we were to represent its complex spectrum, it would be some, some symmetric thing around zero. So the cosine is half of the power goes into positive frequencies, half of the power goes into negative frequencies. The sine, same thing. Half of the power goes into positive frequencies, half the power goes into negative frequencies. The fact that there's an I here and a minus sign here, it doesn't matter when we're taking the magnitude. This is all the magnitude of the, of the spectrum, magnitude of the amplitude. Okay, same thing here, magnitude of the amp amplitude. Amplitude. So in, in the complex representation, the, there are negative frequencies, but they're always just a mirror image of the positive frequencies. Why do we even bother? Well, we bother because it makes thinking about what the spectrum of this stair-steppy thing is a lot easier. And there's a, there's a bunch of, I'm gonna erase some, some stuff here. Uh, I need a lot of horizontal space, so I'm actually gonna erase this whole thing here. So there's some interesting math that goes into to proving what I'm about to show you, but I, I'm not gonna go through all the math. It involves um, understanding how convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain and vice versa. Uh, maybe you have seen this in some of your math classes, maybe not. And just give you the answer. I'll say, what is the, what is the spectrum of the blue signal? And, and for that, let me just redraw this on a much longer scale. So, so here's zero, so we're gonna deal with complex frequencies. The, um, the original audio spectra is gonna be a triangle with or we know whatever it is. I'll just draw it as a wavy triangle. That's going to go. Uh, oops, need to be symmetric. That was very, very symmetric. So it's going to go from zero frequency up to, you know, somewhere less than twenty kilohertz. Because there's no reason to have audio above twenty kilohertz. Okay, so let's say it's called twenty kilohertz minus twenty kilohertz. So that's the frequency of the original sine wave. What's the frequency of the blue sample time would look like? Well, for that, we need to know what the sampling frequency is. So let me just pick a sampling frequency of, I don't know, somewhere around here. Let me call this F sample. You know, on this picture, it's some like maybe 50 kilohertz. Um, and then everything's symmetric, so there's gonna be a minus F sample. And let me actually give myself even more room here. Because what's going to happen is if we're sampling at the sampling frequency here, 
what we need to do is we need to mark all integer multiples of the sampling frequency. So there's that one, there's two, two FS, there's three FS, there's actually minus two FS, but it's off the, off the board, I can't, can't mark it. Okay, so what does the frequency spectrum of the blue look like? Well, even, even though it looks weird and stair-stepping and complicated, its frequency spectrum is pretty simple. It's just a copy of the spectrum at, at around zero frequency, and then a copy of, of the spectrum at every integer, in, every integer multiple of the sampling frequency. And these, these copies might have slightly different heights depending on exactly how you do the sampling and reconstruction. There's gonna be another copy around there, another copy around here, another copy around here. Often they'll be a little bit smaller if, if you're doing a stair-step kind of reconstruction, they're gonna be copied down here. And what's nice about this is then you can filter, you have a low pass filter that goes out to 20 kilohertz and then cuts off all frequencies above say 30 kilohertz. And you know, since I'm doing complex representations, everything's symmetric here. So if you have a, a really good low pass filter, it'll pass everything up to 20 kilohertz and cut everything off. And what you get back is an exact copy of the frequency spectrum and, and therefore the original sine waves that you put in. And so you can sort of maybe vaguely imagine if you take the stair step thing and, and smooth it out, so it's not just linearly interpolating, it's actually passing this through a, a proper low pass filter. But if you smooth this, this stair stepping thing out, um, you will get a slightly delayed version of, of the original uh, wave coming in. And that's, um, that's pretty impressive. So this is the, the Nyquist-Shannon sampling method. And you go right to the, the fact that you need to sample at at least twice the frequency, because you can imagine if I lower my sampling frequency, all of these are gonna, all these copies are gonna start to squish together. And as soon as you're, you get low enough, the high frequencies here are gonna start to intersect with the mirrored versions of the high frequencies there. So, so let me show you a version of that picture. And if you're sampling too slowly and you get that kind of intersection, no amount of filtering is gonna fix it after the fact. Right, once you've contaminated your original signal, you can't un uncontaminate it. So this is why you have to sample fast enough. And you can see exactly what fast enough means. Well, if my original spectrum goes out to 20K, then this mirror is gonna go down from my sampling frequency down by 20K. And so in order to sample fast enough, the sampling frequency needs to be more than twice 20K. And I need to have a little bit of a gap in between here so that my filter can have some, some uh, roll off here. So as long as you're sampling more than twice as fast, it doesn't have to be much more than twice as fast, depends on how good your filter is. As long as you're sampling more than twice as fast, you could, you could reconstruct the original signal. So let me draw the case where, where we're not sampling fast enough. So here's, here's my zero again. Uh, oh. Let me, move, let me move my zero over here. I made myself a lot of it. There's zero. And here's my, my original frequency spectrum. Oh, and let me, let me draw one more thing here. If I were to have a tone, imagine I have a tone here. There's, because I'm doing a complex spectrum, the tone's always symmetric. And if I ask what do the tones look like in blue, well, I'm going to have a tone here and a tone here right over it. Then I'm going to have a tone here and a tone here and a tone here and a tone here. I'm gonna have pairs of, pairs of tones uh, on e equally on either side of the, the sampling frequency. So if, if I were to really put in a pure sine wave instead of a complex audio signal, what I would see is I would, uh, if I took the spectrum of it, and if you take, take the spectrum in, in the, with, your, uh, with your oscilloscope device, you can take these spectra, you only see the, the positive numbers. So you, you, you only see the positive frequency. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the, the tone that you put in plus these pairs that repeat every integer multiple of the sampling. Ah, okay, so, so let's, let's say what happens if you're, if you're sampling not fast enough. So here's, so you, you put in a spectra like that or you put in tones, you put in some tones. Um, 
what you're going to get out is a, a, a spectrum like this and tones, and then you'll also get copies out. So let's say you, you get a copy that's here, and a copy that's here. And now I'm not sampling fast enough, so all these are starting to run into each other. And a copy that's here, and you get some negative copies here, it's running asymmetric around zero because it's real, real numbers, symmetric spectra. And so you can see there's some overlap here. And my, my pairs of tones are all going to start to, to emerge. So as you lower the sampling frequency, all these, these pairs are going to start to, to go down and eventually overlap with what you started with. And some of you may have learned hints of this in various classes, especially engineering classes. But uh, I'm actually, we're actually going to build something today in lab where you can see this happening on the oscilloscope as you change the sampling frequency and you can hear it. You can hear all these extra tones and how they move around and, and what they do. So let me, uh, let me go do a demo now. It's going to take me a minute to set up the demo. OK, so what I have set up here is a way more complicated version of what you're going to build today. And the reason it's way more complicated is because you are going to use your your um, your oscilloscope device to provide all the timing. Uh, whereas when I built this, I didn't have a device that could provide all the timing. So I had to build little 555 oscillators for all the different things that provide timing. So, so basically, let me just walk, point you through the parts of this that you're going to build. There's basically just the Nucleo board here. And there's a, uh, an input, which in this case is just um, this, the uh, yellow wire, so the signal generator, and an, an output, which is going to look like the stair-steppy thing, which I'm going to measure there. And at first, that's basically all you're going to do. You're just going to build, build the nucleo and put in a sine wave and uh, have the output be on the scope. And you're going to control how often it samples by using one of the other lines from the, uh, from the oscilloscope device. But I'm going to control how fast it samples by, by turning this knob labeled sample, which is connected to a timer. So first, I'm going to sample very fast. Let me, let me share the screen and let me show you a few pictures of, of this. Uh, okay, so what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the orange trace is the input into the nucleo board and the blue trace is the output where the sampling is happening very quickly. And, and I'm just putting in a tone and the tone is at two kilohertz. And uh, I can decrease the sampling, and you can start to see the stair steppiness appear. So now I'm sampling less and less and less. It looks more and more and more steppy, sampling less and less and less, more and more steppy, sampling less and less and less. Eventually, I sample so little that here I'm sort of about at the limit, where I'm getting one max and one min. So it sort of turns it into a square wave. And if I sample even less, it just you can barely see what's going on. But let me zoom, let me zoom out here. And you can kind of see, let me go even slower. You can kind of see that if I'm sampling really slowly, I actually end up getting a very slow square wave coming out, or sorry, a very slow uh, uh, sine wave coming out, a steppy sine wave. I've actually turned this high frequency orange into a very low frequency blue. So let me, uh, let me go back to sampling very quickly. Let's do the same thing, but in, in the, with the spectrum analyzer. So the spectrum analyzer is one of the other uh, one of the other tabs you can use. I don't know if we've really used it very much, but let me run this. So unfortunately, you cannot use the oscilloscope and the spectrum analyzer at the same time. So uh, let me let me go up to ten kilohertz. Sorry, to twenty kilohertz. Okay. And maybe resolution doesn't need to be quite so, so good. OK. All right, so let's look at, let me see if I can zoom in here. There we go. 
Okay. So what you see is you see a spike way down here at zero hertz. And that's because my sine waves are both offset from zero. Right? In order to get it into and out of the, the microcontroller, the microcontroller only goes from zero to 3.3 .3 volts. So there's going to be some, some overall offset. And that offset shows up as, as a, a spike at zero, which there's nothing we could do about it. There's just some overall offset. We're going to ignore that. Um, and right now, I'm sampling super fast. So I have a spike, an orange spike. Let me get rid of my blue signal here. So there's, there's my orange spike on the input. Let me connect my, my output again. My blue spike on the output, they look the same. And there's some, some noise here that's, that's uh, much lower. So only look at the spikes that are kind of large. Uh, you see this is a log scale. So anything that's not almost as big as this is, is just noise that you can never really do much about, can never really hear. Let me do one more thing. I have a speaker hooked up and there's a circuit if you want to hook up a speaker. So let me turn, let me turn the speaker on. So sometimes zoom filters out frequencies, but can you all hear that two kilohertz tone? Okay. Now let me lower the sampling rate. So I'm lowering the sampling rate, lowering the sampling rate. So, oops, sort of jumping around because it's not a very good oscillator. You can see that here is, here's another copy of my complex spectra here and here. And as I lower the sampling rate, that copy sort of moves, moves up or moves down. And you can even hear that other copy. And the original is still rock solid. It's still right there, it doesn't change. But it's the stair steppingness is giving me these additional frequencies that I can move around. So let me move, let me move them down so that they overlap. So now I'm sampling way too slow. And you can hear that really low, low frequency thing coming in as I get lower and lower and lower. The original is still there, but now there's a low thing that I can't really get rid of. So what you want to do is you want to sample fast enough. You know, somewhere around there. So you can low pass filter around here and recover the original wave. Let's take a look at what that looks like in, on the oscilloscope up here. So that, that looks, pretty, it looks pretty bad. You know, we're maybe sampling four, four samples per sine wave. But if we were to actually low pass filter it and have the cutoff be somewhere around here, we would be able to perfectly reconstruct that sine wave. So I also have a low pass filter set up. So let me do that. Let me, instead of looking at the output of the, um, the output of the uh, nucleo on blue, I'm gonna move, well blue or purple, I'm gonna move blue to be uh, the output of the low pass filter, the thing that's going into the speaker, the thing that we're listening to. Uh, yeah, okay. So the low-pass filter is already low-pass filtering some of this stuff out. But I still have these extra spikes. And I can turn a different knob and lower the cutoff frequency of the low-pass filter and get rid of more and more of those spikes. So there, I'm, there I got rid of the, the spikes that were causing trouble. You still hear the two kilohertz. There we go. Now, now we got rid of the two kilohertz. Let me get rid of the orange for a second. Uh, so I don't want my I don't want my low pass filter to get rid of the the signal I care about at two kilohertz, but I do want it to get rid of the signal here at five point something. So you let me show you how instead of having knobs like I have, let me show you how you're gonna put in clocks, which is actually much much simpler. It just involves some some scopy configuration. Let me turn this audio off because it's annoying. Okay. So um in the in the, the original panel here, there are some tabs that we probably haven't used much. There's a logic analyzer tab, which allows you to use these 16 digital input output channels and just look at them. This is like an oscilloscope, but with 16 channels, which sounds great, except they're only digital channels. So it only ever shows zero and 
you know, high and low. So you can use these digital IO channels as logic analyzer channels, or you can use them as pattern generator channels, which is what we're going to do. And uh, what, where are these channels? Well, if you can see my, let me stop sharing for a second. If you can see my camera, the digital channels are all the channels that are over here off to the side. So you probably haven't plugged in the, the other rat's nest of wires that came with this device. But uh, if you can find it, fish it out of your box and plug it in, you have these 16 channels that are digital input output. We're only gonna use a few of them. But what you could do is you could turn on, let me share the screen again, sorry. Uh, share screen, stop one, share. Um, in, the, uh, in the pattern generator, you can turn on output zero, say, and if you double click on it, it'll give you the settings. And um, this is just how to display it. So you can move, the, move it up and down. And you wanna make sure it's selected push pull, not open drain. So open drain means it'll ground it, but then release it. So it's like having a single transistor that can either ground it or release it. Push pull means it'll either give you a strong connection to ground or a strong connection to five volts. So this is the normal logic out, this is what you want. Um, and then you can select what pattern you want. And the first pattern is clock, which is just a square wave. That's, that's all we're gonna use. But you can, you can have it count. You can have it set a, a random pattern or a binary counter or any of these other weird patterns, but we're just gonna do a clock, just a square wave. And you can set the, the frequency and the phase and the duty cycle. So the duty cycle, if I went to a 10% duty cycle, it would be on only 10% of the time and off 90% of the time, but you know, we don't want that. We want a 50% duty cycle. The phase just doesn't matter because it's relative to other signals. We don't care about that. And the frequency. And so now, now if I looked at the, uh, I believe it's the pink, the pink wire on the digital outputs. Um, if you look at this pink wire on the oscilloscope, let me do that. Let me connect the pink wire to the orange channel on the oscilloscope and run the oscilloscope. Uh, I am getting nothing. Realize that. Go back to signal generator. Signal generator. Oh, I have to. Uh, not signal generator, sorry, pattern generator. Oh, I have to run it. Right. Okay, there we go. Okay, so. Oops, wrong way. So now I've got a nice square wave that goes from, so it's one volt for division, so it goes from zero to one, two, three point three volts. And the, the other wave is not really doing anything. So let me just make sure it's grounded. The blue is just picking up noise. So yeah, so you can change, if I were to go in here and change the uh, pattern generator settings to be a higher frequency, the oscilloscope shows a higher frequency or lower frequency. Frequency never shows up on the pattern generator itself, um, but it'll, it'll show up if you measure it. So you can set up a whole bunch of different clocks that control the sampling and the low pass filter. So there's a special low pass filter where you can actually set its cutoff frequency by putting in a clock that's a hundred times faster than the cutoff frequency you want. And when you do that, it acts like a very good low pass filter. So um, instead of turning a knob like I did to turn down low pass filter, you'll just turn, you know, set the frequency of, of different clocks. So uh, that's, that's what you'll do today in, in the lab. And I would say that the first thing you should do is just set up the Nucleo, run the, run the code that just samples and samples and outputs, just samples, output, samples, output, samples, outputs, and then play with, play with the sampling clock and look at the oscilloscope and look at the spectrum analyzer. And then, and then you can add the low pass filter and look at that. And then you can add the speaker and listen to it. So there's multiple stages. You don't have to do everything all at once. Just getting the nucleo up and running and seeing the, the aliasing, the weird aliasing effects move around 
you can do that with very little actual analog circuitry. And when you want to start low pass filtering and passing it through your, your speakers to hear it, that, that involves some analog circuitry. Um, and the very last thing in the lab is how to hook up your cell phone or, or laptop or some other music making device so you can actually pass music through the system instead of just passing sine waves. And you can listen to what, what it sounds like when you sample your music at different sampling rates and adjust the low pass filter to be different rates. Um, and finally, there's a button that sets the uh, how many bits of sampling you'll use. So it sort of sets the, the vertical axis. All right, so um, I, I am basically done talking for the semester. So does anyone have any questions about the sampling or do you just want to sort of see it and hear it for yourself before you start asking a ton of questions? <laughs>